Hello lovely people, welcome to another book chat, the regular roundup of stuff I've read at some point in my past. Once again I have a whole bunch of books to talk about, so once again I'm just going to dive into it. Sophie vlogs. Um, I will kick things off with a new favourite, there are a couple in this video. This is The Vanished Birds by Simon Jimenez. Essentially we follow this uh, captain of this ship called Nia, who... Um, the way that her ship works is that there's essentially these like two forms of travel. There's like real time and then there's traveling through this specific kind of space which um, real time passes a lot faster when you're in it. So her job involves traveling through this time. So a lot of the time people that she knows she comes back and they've aged by years and that kind of thing. Um, but while she is on one of these runs, um, this mysterious boy who has crash landed on this planet is sort of put into her care. and. Then we sort of like follow from there. It reminded me of Becky Chambers, A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet, but sort of with a completely different outlook. Um, the similarity point would be that you are on this ship for a long time, you follow the crew of this ship, a lot of this is to do with just like following them, their relationships between each other, understanding who they are, understanding the different planets that you're visiting and that kind of thing. But where Becky Chambers' book felt quite hopeful and quite... Um, you know there is conflict but it at the same time there is this sort of like underlying thing of hope that's and it's quite it was quite like a lovely read this is not hopeless but it's very much like a different perspective and it is exploring sort of some of the bad things the repercussions of bad things that happen like a lot of the people who are in this are survivors of things or they have been through really terrible times but they keep going so there's a lot more of a focus on this on some of the harder aspects of life um, but I still had that similar feeling towards this crew where I got really attached to this crew and how they functioned and that kind of thing um, this honestly like the way that this changed perspective really worked for me like the start point is from a completely different character's perspective and that in itself was just like could have been the most perfect short story and then as the story goes through you get to see lots of different characters perspectives and I always just felt like every time a new character perspective was brought in for me it really worked because I really felt like I was really fleshing out my understanding of this situation and these people um, Honestly, I feel like I could talk about this for so long. Oh, I haven't even mentioned that it's like deeply queer, um, very much like found family in space, which is like a huge buzzword of mine. This just had so much in it that I loved. It had so many ideas, it had so many explorations, and I just, this is a five star read for me, this is a new favorite, this is definitely like the type of sci-fi that I really enjoy reading, and I would highly recommend it. If it sounds like your cup of tea, please do give it a go. To switch to a non-fiction, on my Kindle I read It Takes Blood and Guts by Skin, which was written with someone else, and I will include who that is in the link in the description down below because I don't remember the name off the top of my head. Um, Skin is the lead singer of Skunk and Nancy, momentarily forgot their name. Um, essentially, Skunk and Nancy are not a band that I was super into when they were um, in their heyday. I know of them, and I know some of their songs, but I was more interested in reading this to get the perspective on this time of music, but from the perspective of like a queer black woman to see what her experience was like in this sort of like Brit pop, that like British wave kind of moment. And it was really interesting. I really enjoyed getting an understanding of who Skin is, because again, like I, I, I really didn't know her very well, and I've come away and I do feel like I um, very much um, got a sense of her as a person as well as her as an artist and I really like when I read biographies of people coming away um, and feeling like you know they don't have to tell me everything that's happened in their life but if I can come away with an understanding of like if they're some form of artist like what drives them what inspires them how they create um, and then also like their background and who they are and what made them who they are and I feel like this did a really good job of that and I definitely have come away um, listening to more Skunk and Nancy can I give it more of a listen see how I feel about it um, but I just I for, for a person who I didn't know that much about I really enjoyed understanding her experience and the role she had in this particular era of music after that is a classic I read The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas um, I love The Count of Monte Cristo it's like a top fave I did not love this as much. I ended up giving this like a two stars out of five. Um, but it's that funny thing where I still quite enjoyed reading this. Because essentially I read most of this uh, going up to Manchester and back on the train. So it, I had, I had like a lot of time on my hands. And I seemed 
through it because there's a lot of action in this you know like uh, I haven't given you a plot summary because I kind of assumed that people would know like the concept of the three musketeers but we follow D'Artagnan who is a Gascon and he has um, he's arrived in the city and uh, he he is sort of like immediately gets in a bunch of fights and then meets the three musketeers and they become a bit of a gang and there's like this power struggle between um, the cardinal's forces and the musketeers and all of this sort of stuff and I did enjoy a lot of the like adventure novel kind of side of it like it's quite funny at the start how he just he's like <laughs> and again the narrative is occasionally what tripped me up because I find it quite funny that he turns up and then immediately gets in a fight with literally everyone it was possible to get in a fight with but then the narration is like uh, D'Artagnan was a level-headed young man, and I was like, I'm sorry, have you heard your own words? Have you read what you have written? Level-headed? Methinks not. Um, so there was, what I enjoyed about this and what kept me reading was to these sort of plot machinations, they are sent on little missions, and they have these little, like, duels and stuff like that, and that was really fun. What I didn't like about this so much is the deep, deep misogyny, and, I, you know, I, I read classics and I am aware of the time that they're written, and I'm not expecting, like, a feminist masterpiece. I, I hadn't realised how absolutely vital, like, violence against women is to some of the back characters' backstories. There was just a lot of characters just talking about how terrible women are, you can't trust a single woman, they're so horrendous. Um, and I think one thing is that, like, the, the, like, one of the villains in this, like, Milady, is, I think, really cool. Like, I'm not trying to be, like, she's a lovely human being, because she's not, but I think she is an interesting villain, and I think she's potentially a slightly more interesting villain than I feel like this plot allowed her to be. Like, a lot of the, the, how they beat her just felt a bit convenient, especially because she's sort of been shown to be, like, such a mastermind, and I felt like it kind of undercut her character the way that they managed to, like, beat her. But also just, like, um, I think it was Cara from Wild Book Garden's review that I read. Um, I, I had listened to her review on YouTube before I read this, and I, I, I was aware of her misgivings, and I was aware that they might be similar things to what I felt, and they have turned out that way. And I think it was her review that pointed out that a lot of the traits that Milady has are traits that in Edmund in uh, Count of Monte Cristo are heroic, but in this they are villainous. And that framing, like, because it's a woman it's bad, but when it's the guy it's, like, the hero. Like, now that that's been pointed out, like, I really do see that. Um, I don't know. It's one of those where it's like, I didn't hate reading this. But I also don't feel like I can rate it that highly because I do think that there are like fundamental problems and there are like stuff to do with it that I didn't love. I do have The Man in the Iron Mask and I probably will still read it because I own it and I'll see how I feel about that one. I'm not sure I'm going to go out of my way to buy any more of the D'Artagnan romances because I just don't think I'm going to be that interested in them. To go back to another piece of non-fiction, I also read Royal Witches, Witchcraft and the Nobility in 15th Century England by Gemma Holman. Um, this is another one that I had mixed feelings of. I gave this a three stars. Um, I loved a lot about this. Specifically, we are following um, four women from around the time of the Wars of the Roses. So we follow Joan of Navarre, um, Eleanor, Eleanor Chapman, um, and then Jacquetta and Elizabeth Woodville. And as a book that is biographies of these women, brilliant. Specifically, Joan of Navarre and Eleanor Chapman, um, I feel like I knew a lot less about. Like, I, uh, you know, um, Philippa Gregory has written books about the Woodvilles. Like, I feel like they're the two that are definitely more well known. So, I really, really appreciated getting an understanding of these women and just like their roles because I had heard of them, but I, I didn't really know a lot about them. So, I loved that aspect of it. I also enjoyed, in some ways, the structure of this because it reminded me a bit of Helen Castor's She Wolves, which followed um, some women in history who ruled independently before Elizabeth the first, or rather who tried to rule independently, and that she all sort of like built this narrative that was like, what are the precedents that these people have set that Elizabeth the first was then able to draw on? And I feel like this is doing that in regards to accusations of witchcraft against noble women, because it's going, okay, what happened to Joan of, uh, Joan of Navarre? How did that affect what happened to Eleanor Chapman? Like both for the person who accused them, so the accusers were learning, what was successful and what was not successful, and also for the accused, like how do you handle this? What has the better chance of leading to you not dying, and what has the better chance of you um, regaining some of your titles again, and that kind of thing. So that was also really, really interesting. I think 
the downside is that based on the title I expected just a lot more exploration of witchcraft, like this is very much a biography of these women that then explores how they were accused of witchcraft, but even then I didn't feel like that much time was often given to that section, to how they were accused. I just, because the subtitle is like witchcraft and nobility, I think I thought that there would be more discussion of how witchcraft was used by the nobility, like how did noble women use witchcraft? Um, what examples do we have of like um, other witch trials? Because there, there, I know that the like boom in witch trials didn't really happen around this time, but um, occasionally she did mention other like people who've been accused of witchcraft. Like, what was a normal sentence? And I think I just like for a book that is called Royal Witches, I wanted more of that. I wanted to have a deeper understanding, and maybe even an understanding of how witchcraft for the nobility differed from witchcraft for the common people. Like, um, were the trials still the same? Like, you know, was it more lenient for the nobility? I, I just I have all these questions that I feel like weren't super answered. So I, I did think that this did a really great job of sort of like giving me the narrative of these women's lives. It does fall a little bit into that like we can imagine that so and so felt this way or so and so must have felt this because like lack of primary sources and I'm willing to be like yeah sure that's a problem but like I feel like it still managed to weave a great narrative. It's just for a book that is marketed as a book about royal witches I felt like it kind of didn't super deliver on that. Then we have an old favourite but sticking to a historical theme this is Hope for the Best by Jodie Taylor which is I don't even remember what book number this is in the Chronicles of St Mary's because it's been going on for ages and I still really enjoy them. Um, I will be quite quick talking about this one because we're so deep into a series. Essentially we are still following Max but in this one she is trying to deal with a very old foe who just won't seem to go away and so there are some elaborate schemings. The Time Police have much more of a presence in this one. Max goes and spends some time being at Time Police HQ which was interesting. Um, I think one of the things I feel about this series is that I always have a great time reading them. I know I'm going to have fun. At the same time, by this point, I can kind of see us repeating a few things. I do feel like there are some um, things which I, I would like some plots to just be finished. Um, there's always like a twist that means, oh no, it's not over yet. And I'm like, I want there to be more books, but also maybe we could like move on to a different problem, maybe? I don't know, but on the whole, I, re I still really have fun with these, I really enjoy them, I have the next one lined up to read, and I will be diving into it very soon, because I do want to know how we're going to deal with this big problem. Um, yeah, it's always fun. I also listened to a book, I listened to Flying Too High by Kerry Greenwood on audio, because I'm starting to get into audiobooks. This is book number three, I think? or two, two or three in the Miss Fisher murder mystery series. I love the TV show of this. Essentially, Miss Fisher is approached by this woman who is convinced that her son is going to try and kill her husband, and when her husband dies, her son obviously falls under suspicion. There is a second plot that involves the kidnapping of a child, um, and there's a whole load of stuff to do with airplanes and flying. And I enjoy Miss Fisher's murder mysteries. They have a delightful, like, 1920s flapper heroine, and we have fun times. I found some of the tone of this one quite jarring because we dealt with some very severe topics, trigger warning for uh, child abuse, and um, I just felt like they were handled in a quite a, a, a way of humour that I didn't, I didn't always feel like it sat well together. There was some stuff to do with the conclusion and how like certain characters who are like legitimately referred to as like um, child abusers and stuff like this were then like, I, I, I felt like they weren't handled in a in a, slight, in a slightly strange way so wasn't super great about that so it was a solid like three stars like I had a perfectly fine time it's definitely not my favorite Miss Fisher um and I, I'll be interested to see when I continue to read more books in the series if this like weird tone thing continues and therefore if I just prefer how they adapted to the television series or if maybe because this is like the second book it gets a bit better as it goes on we'll see and finally I want to end on another book that is a new favorite that I loved this is The Kingdoms by Natasha Pulley, and I've realised that by this point I will read pretty much everything Natasha Pulley ever puts out because I love her and I think her writing is beautiful and I just always get on very well with her. We follow Jo and we're in this like alternate version of London whereby the French won in um, the Napoleonic Wars and so Lon the London that he is in is very, like everyone speaks French, everything is named after French names, um, and he kind of, he's like come off this train and he has no idea who he is. He has this 
type of amnesia and it turns out that many people across the country have this. They're referring to it as a type of epilepsy that causes amnesia but he has a particularly bad case and he really can't remember anything about his life. He starts to like pick up the pieces of what life it turns out he had and he receives this postcard that is sent from this lighthouse in Scotland that just says come home if you remember M. And he has the opportunity eventually to go to this lighthouse and he goes and he investigates and he wants to try and find out about his past. And then shenanigans ensue. This is one of those books that has so, so like twists and turns and the act of puzzling things out and picking up on the details that she gives in is wonderful. Were there reveals in this that I predicted? Yes. But I kind of take the view that that's because I was given the pieces I needed to predict them. I, for me personally, like, I know sometimes I do complain about how long it takes between you as a reader knowing things and then having to wait for the person to catch up. I don't know if I'm just biased because I like Natasha Pulley. So there will be some people who will read this who will be like, this was so obvious and you took too long to notice it and that ruined the reading experience for me. And I get that. I had a lovely time because I enjoyed, um, with stuff to do with like alternate history it's really interesting seeing how the what has changed and what the details are there are like m levels of like little mysteries within this so as joe is discovering more about himself you also get this like secondary mystery with that you're also trying to figure out what happened to people involved with a character in this called kite who so deeply makes me think of captain flint from black sails in that here is this figure who is initially like an antagonistic figure who is because he is prepared to do whatever it takes and he does some highly questionable things and that kind of thing but as it goes on you gain more of an understanding of this person and you end up in this almost conflicted space where you're like I kind of feel for you deeply even though you did this thing that I still think is deeply wrong um and I kind of enjoy that like emotional turmoil what can I say Natasha Pulley she gives me what I want um, so yeah, I loved this. I love Natasha Pulley. I cannot recommend her enough. This was interesting to read in comparison to her other books because her other books very much are all part of the same series and it's, again, it's like this version of the world that is so close to ours but has these elements of like um, things that don't obey the rules of our world and this has it in a different way but there are things about this that are like twisty and turny and that kind of thing. So yes, absolutely loved it. Um, that's everything I wanted to talk about this week. As per usual, I would love to hear your thoughts on any of these. Please do leave me a comment down below. Uh, otherwise, I hope you're having a really lovely day. I will see you next time for something different.